So um, there's a lengthy, well, not so lengthy, uh, when, given his track record and his history, um, but there is discussion about Brother Andre here. I would just like to say that this is my star counseling psychologist. And many people have now come to recognize this as he goes across, well, I was gonna say the island, but also outside and on radio, um, on TV, uh, he is there. And so this is the person, well, he will tell me that I am also um, in need of counseling because all of us have some issues. So, but this is the person, if I had money, I would go to. <laughs> for advice on anything um, related to, to psychology. So um, you might have been uh, reading that. So that's basically where we are. Brother Andre is going to lead us uh, this evening. Um, I will um, kind of in the back seat um, add comments as necessary. So without further ado, I'm going to um, invite Brother Andre Alan Casey to take us through. So, Brother Andre, welcome. And okay, thank you very much. Step forward. Okay, thank you so very much. My seat as usual, because I know <laughs> that you bring a lot to the table. Um, and though I have been in marriage for a little while, I know that I will learn something from it. <laughs> I'm not sure I should eat my wife. <laughs> so listen, because you might put me on the spot, but yes, go ahead, sir. I thank you so very much. Uh, just a little bit, um, I, by no stretch of the imagination, I'm saying I'm, I'm an expert, so I'm just giving my disclaimer right here and right now. Um, all of us are still learning as it relates to the making and keeping of our relationship. And in this context, we're talking about marriage relationship. We have possibly 21 or so points that we want to present, but we're not going to cover all 21. We're going to probably just do about... Uh, 10 or 11, maybe 10, between 10 and 11 tonight, we'll see how that goes. So as to give you also an opportunity to ask questions, we invite you to write down your questions, please. If you hear something, you can put it also into the chat um, right away, and then we'll come back to it and, uh, and um, answer those questions as best as possible. As far as an introduction is concerned, I'm just going to read what you have on your screen there. I'll be speaking um, at length to some of the, the um, pictures that you might see come up on your screen. Um, um, notwithstanding, it is best for us to wait for one uh, than to settle for the one that is available. Um, it's best to wait for the one you love than the person who's around. A lot of times we settle because that's the person who's around so to speak but the truth is it is best for us to wait and if we can't find anybody <laughs> then maybe it is best for us to be alone um, rather than make uh, a hasty decision and decide to marry to someone who's just available for that matter uh, there are some pointers we need to take under consideration though and I like this African proverb that says, before you get married, keep both eyes open. And after you marry, close one eye. If you love your mate and want the relationship to grow and evolve, you have got to learn how to close one eye and not let every little thing bother you. Because oftentimes in our marriage relationships, we become fault finders rather than problem solvers. You know, we are quick to, to label and to complain rather than compliment. And so we just want to remind folks that before you get involved and make a commitment to someone, uh, do not let loss, desperation, immaturity, ignorance, pressure from others, or even low self-esteem 
uh, make you blind to warning signs. Low self-esteem, oftentimes we bring that element into our marriage relationships. And so we, are, we seek what is called validation in, in, in leaps and bounds, literally from our partners in order for us to feel secure into the relationship. And so, um, and if it is not forthcoming, then oftentimes we say we don't feel loved by our partners. I am saying it is important for us to have self-esteem even before you come into the marriage relationship. A good question to ask is if, suppose you don't have it, suppose you don't have it before and you got married to the person. Good question, but we're not going to answer it yet. But good question though. <laughs> Keep your eyes open and don't fool yourself that you can change someone or that what you see as false aren't really that important. We're saying here, once you decide to commit to someone, over time, there are different things that will happen. Their flaws, their vulnerabilities, their pet peeves and their differences will become more obvious. You and your mate have different expectations. And that's one of the things we need to recognize, realize and accept about each other. We have different expectations. We, each, we also have different emotional needs. Maybe the next time I'm presenting, I'm going to talk about the five or six primary emotional needs of the male, of the husband, and the five or six primary emotional needs of the female or the wife. Because oftentimes we fail to satisfy those emotional needs in each other. But not at this goal, we're going to say it, but um, in our maybe two weeks or so from now, third, third, um, but um, third, th the next time we're on, <laughs> third Saturday, right? Okay. 19th. But the 19th. So we are saying here, we have different emotional needs. We have different values. We have different dreams. That's right. Different dreams. We have different weaknesses and the different strengths. And so we need to appreciate these things about each other if we not only want to make or to but also to ensure the success of our mar marriages we need to recognize equally these differences in each other um, but while that is true i think respecting our equality is what is also going to help us to achieve um, unity and that equality, folks, is how we are measured in the eyes of Almighty God. We are two individual children of God. So we need to recognize to whom we belong. And so if you believe that your partner is a child of God, if you believe that about each other, then we have to be very, very careful about how we treat each other. Since that person belonged to Almighty God. Since I belong to Almighty God, we're two unique individual children of God who have decided to share a life together. Neither of us are perfect, but we must strive to be perfect for each other. Let me start. Now we have completed our introduction. To make and keep my marriage, my marriage mandates that it be God-centered. And that's the first place I need to begin. And why so? Because oftentimes we... Uh, compete, compare, control. Oftentimes we spend too much time looking at what the other person is not doing or we don't recognize that there has to be a standard, uh, an objective standard that's going to govern how we live. It is, it is our understanding that God instituted marriage and so what better person to consult about our terms and conditions in relation to this great union. That being said, everybody subjects themselves to some kind of philosophy that really and truly governs their choices. We have, we have found that the principles of Christianity, if utilized, um, will produce successful marriages. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 12, um, though one be overpowered, Two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. A couple with God, I am putting to us, is the third cord at the center, and it can be a formidable union. 
it is very important for us to recognize who God must be into this relationship. He must be at the top. He must be in the middle. He must be at the side. He must never be at the bottom. <laughs> but the point I'm making, folks, we need to consult him in relation to not only how we think, but even more, more, more importantly, um, uh, what, how we behave in relation to each other. How would God want me to behave? What would God want me to do in, this, in these circumstances? So God must be at the helm of our relationships. If he's not there, folks, then what we are, in essence, will have to do is we will have to now subject ourselves to what we think and how we feel at any given situation rather than going to the person who instituted marriage into the first place. Find out from him what he wants and how is it that he wants this union to be governed. Number two, to make and keep my marriage mandates that I fulfill my role as a husband and I fulfill my role as a wife. Let me start off to the wives. To the wives. There are some things that we need to be mindful of in relation to what your husband needs. And if you don't know what he needs, then I can easily understand that, that we make choices and decisions that will unfulfill ourselves. Oftentimes, we use ourselves as a point of reference in how we treat each other. But the point is, folks, we need to step back and find out from our mate how is it that they want to be treated. He needs his maleness affirmed. How is that affirmed? How is his maleness affirmed? It is affirmed in three primary ways. It is affirmed in three primary ways. Sexual fulfillment, sharing interest, and leadership. These are the three ways that his maleness is affirmed. And we never said lordship. <laughs> it's not such a word. But we said leadership. We're talking about leading by an ex by example the direction that he would like for his family to go, that he was the one who take you on as his wife. And as a result of that, you see, he has not only a goal, but he has a place that he would like to take this relationship. And you need to feel safe and to an extent make yourself vulnerable so that he can lead without getting pushed back, without getting pushed back. And so to the ladies, please remember his leadership, sharing his interest that too oftentimes, you know, it is his friends that shares his interest. And sometimes you have other females out there that shares his interest. I'm inviting our wives to say, guess what happened? Him like Domino. I know you don't like Domino. Go and go play Domino with him. Go and go learn how to play Domino. Go and go learn how to play Ludi. I mean, snake and ladder, whatever. All I am saying here, <laughs> go, to, go to the sporting games with him. You know, go to the sporting games with him. It cannot be that he and his co-workers all the time are going to these places. And you are not there with him. And worse, that he's asking and you're saying, why well, go on by yourself. No, this is, this is why he asked you in the first place. Because he wants you to be a part of it. If he's watching a program on, on, the, on the television and he's excited about it, sit down, man, and ask him, you know, who is this? What is that? So that you can have a clear understanding of what is it that he's watching. Be careful of some sports, too, because if he's intently viewing it, he don't want too much question from you, by the way. Just saying. But sharing his interest. And by the way, sexual fulfillment. For the male, when a man feels sexually fulfilled, um, it, uh, it also affirms his maleness. It makes him feel important. It makes him feel like a man. Okay? More importantly, it makes him feel loved. It makes him feel what? It makes him feel loved. This is why sex cannot be used as a tool in a marriage against the men. Against the men. Because that makes him feel needed. That makes him feel what? It makes him feel needed. When the wife says, I want you, I need you, I want to share my whole body with you. That makes him feel very, very good. He, he, and so that is how his maleness, again, these are the three ways in which his maleness is affirmed. But not only that, he needs a playmate. 
somebody whom can ramp with. Yes, man, them come home, you're you not know, stiff. You know, <laughs> you know, him can rub you, him can tickle, him can scratch your foot bottom, whatever. Him can play into your ear, okay? Um, that's what I'm saying. He needs someone that him, that him can have fun with also. He needs someone to be proud of him. You know, every time when you're watching somebody, be it a, a TV program, or when you come home, you're talking about your boss or your supervisor or, or, or one of your co-workers. And, and you seem to be talking volume of these other males, or even your preacher too. They're talking about so many other things um, about other men. And all oh, know him can't hear him name. Hmm? Oh, no, him can't hear him name. <laughs> you know, you know what somebody says, I just love Denzel Washington. I just love and I just love. And you call Arnold Schwarzenegger. You call everybody else name of who you just love. And all oh, know you can't call him name. Not only that, if you even go to the workplace, guess what happened? You have the children you know, um, on, your, on, your, on your display uh, um, at work or on your phone or wherever. But all know him can see film face and your face um, on, on your WhatsApp um, display for, for, for that matter. He doesn't feel like you're proud of him. You're proud of, you're proud of everybody else except him. You know, when you, go, when, you, when you go on the road, you know, people must hear, people must say, Lord, master, you're proud of your husband, eh? Because every time you say, my husband, my husband, my husband, my husband. That's right. That's how he. That's how you're going to make him feel proud of. We, we, we rather for him to feel proud, okay? Because of the things that you do and because of the things that you say. Not only that, ladies, he also needs peace and quiet. Oh yes. Sometimes when he comes home, he wants to retire. Most times he retires in front of the TV. It's not that boy him boring and and him just him, him just you know. But but him having favorite seat. I, and him want to retire there, so you know. So you know that after him finish watching, what him watching uh, or, or feel relaxed, you know, you know, so he might get up and then and then want to be a part of everything else. Now, all we're saying here is say, everybody, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, please understand if he's forced to operate outside of his comfort zone, and if especially if that comfort zone is where I need what peace and quiet, if every time. He has been taken out of that zone, the zone where he needs peace and quiet. Him can be frustrated and miserable. Just saying. He's going to be frustrated and miserable. He must start kissing teeth, or hissing teeth rather. You know, him, him going to be like him don't hear you and ignore you. You can get vexed and say, you don't hear me, I talk to you. Right? Because he needs his peace and quiet. And so sometimes you have to learn to choose your battles in when you come and even raise a certain conversation with him. Then come home, if he even says, if you say to him, how was the day? And he says, well, you see that he's very reserved in, in wanting to, to articulate how was his day. Then, then don't pressure him too much. Incrementally, yes, but not pressure, don't pressure him too much. They say, all right, um, if you feel like to talk, just understand that I'm right here. So, and right here don't mean that you're upstairs and him downstairs. But right here means that you're right there, so beside him. You don't have to say anything. Just watch where him and watch them. Okay? You would like a glass of milk, warm milk for that matter. That's all I'm saying here. We him feel like, listen, man, i rather come home every time and any time because of the kind of treatment that I get from my wife. But not only that, he needs admiration and respect. I think it's a big thing that for, for most husbands, they need what? Admiration and respect. Admiration and respect, okay? And, and so the, the, I'm proud of you. When you announce and you speak about the things that he consistently and constantly does um, for the home, for the family, and, and, and you speak volume of those things and you remind him about it. Thank you very much for, for, for what you do, for what you did. Thank you for cooking. Thank you for helping with the children. Thank you for helping with the homework. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. That's what I'm saying. And I'm so proud whenever you do these things. And you know, you know, whenever you do these things, the way it makes me feel. Thank you. That's what I'm saying. You know, I, I couldn't have made a better choice. No, seriously. You know, um, every so often I hear my wife say that to me. And, and I smile from ear to ear. Seriously. And, 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 and I know she's not just buttering my bread. <laughs> but it's true. Every so often. And it's more than, it's, I can take out the, the I, can, I can say, I can say very often, 
on a serious note, I hear it. And, and I can tell you how it makes me feel. And I'm saying whenever I have conversations with husbands, they need to hear those things. Some husbands complain that, why you know something? Not, no, sir. Respect, no, sir. We don't know a name, sir. Adma, Adma, what? Them can't even call the word. <laughs> but he needs admiration and he needs respect. But not only that. When your husband comes home from work, greet him with a hug, cheerful words. Do not have a sour face, but be happy to see him. Okay? Look for good qualities. Mention them often to him. If you hear someone say something nice about your husband, tell him. Always, I'm saying here, put yourself in, in, in such a position where, you know, you look even presentable. You look what? Presentable. When him come home, you know, it's amazing. You look presentable to go, to, to go out on the road. And, and when you come home, you, you take off your presenting. <laughs> You know, you, 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 you dress up to go present yourself. <laughs> and when you come home, you take off your presenting. <laughs> no, man, sometimes, sometimes when you come home, keep on the dress, keep on the this, keep on the that. That's all I'm just saying here. When you come, you say, ooh, you look good, you're going somewhere. And you just said to him, say, I'm right here. That's where I'm going. I'm, 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 right, I'm, 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 I'm going right here to be with you. That's where I am. Okay, that's all I'm saying here. Okay, and, and I'm not, not just a dress, whatever they hear, whatever, anything. But I'm just saying, look the part where, um, as far as he's concerned, he wants to consistently admire you. I like how you look. Do your nails, if you have, do your hair. That's what I'm saying here. You know, uh, make yourself presentable. Okay, um, tell your children, finally, tell your children how much you appreciate their father. Tell them, you know, I, I'm so proud of your father. It's when him hear that, again, you know, that goes back to the respect and the admiration, you know. Him feel like a proper provider and protector. He feels like a proper provider and protector. And so, wow. You see, I'm so proud of your father. When the children now are looking to him too. And the children equally admire him. Both male and female. Now, now to the females. Talking, talking rather, we want to talk now to the husbands. And I want to share some things about um, how you should be treating your wife. Okay? One of the first things we put out there is that she needs to feel valuable. She needs to feel what? Valuable. It's amazing how many wives don't feel valuable. Too many wives feel as if they have been taken for granted. They don't feel valuable, you know? Because the, the husbands are consistently saying, you need to, you need to, you need to. Go and do this and go and do that. You need to, you need to, you need to. And so as far as they are concerned, they, they are just bellowing out orders and instructions to the wives. And the wives, amazing, have so many th different things to do. It's as if to say, because some, some husbands behave as if to say they are the only ones that are working. So they had, so they come and say, they're hard at work. Hey. So the wife had a hard day at work too. <laughs> okay, she equally had a hard day at work. So your hard day at work is not harder than her hard day at work. Okay, everybody had a hard day at work. I'm saying she needs to feel valuable that when she comes home, you can say, you can take the shoes off her foot. Come out of these heels. They can rope down our legs. You put them, you put them tired? Mm, hush. They can beat our foot too, you know. Yes, you don't have to run go for the control. Make sure you sit down and recline at the seat and you give her the control and, and say, flip, find it, enter any one chair, fine. And you go and go prepare the meal in the, in the meantime. This is how you're tired, okay? As a matter of fact, it cannot be that every time she come home, she must cook. No, nah, man. Mm -mm. You split it up in two, in which, me, which, me, which then means that you have to learn to cook then if you can't cook. Go on, go learn to cook. Help on the house. If you can't cook, then do some housework. Go on, go sweep, go clean the place, go wipe the floor, whatever. Go on, go dust. And she said, she said leave that. I said, no, 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 honey. Don't you do something? This is my part to play, man. And I know I can't go outside for go, for go more land anyways. <laughs> Sorry, right? But I'm saying do something around the house where she don't feel like, say, boy, I have this for do, I have that for do. Like, 
like she feel like a proper maid. No, she don't feel valuable if she feel like a proper maid, folks. Okay, I am saying that's how you make her feel valuable. Where you sit, that where she must sit down, and you do the maid work. Sorry, um, but if you understand, I'm saying help her out, help her out, do your part to to for her to feel valuable. She needs to share intimate moments with you. Sometimes when she asks you, how was it, you know? Guess what happened? Do the reverse, no? Shakar. Rather than she come ask you, how was your day? You said to her, how was your day? You start, you initiate by asking that question. How was it, honey? How were you doing? And when she starts to talk, don't start, don't start to yawn. Okay? Don't zone her out. Don't start flip the channel when she's talking. That's the time for even I'll put the TV up on mute and, 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 and give her eye contact. Okay? Where, where, where she knows that you're executing what is called active listening. She wants to share intimate moments with you. Even when she's watching something and, and she feels touched by it or she reads something and she say, I want to share this with you. Make sure you read it to you. Make sure you read it to you or, or you read it to or you read it yourself, whatever. But she wants to share those intimate moments with you. Sometimes she come, she wants to come and she just want to um, hug you and just cuddle up into your arms. Make sure you do that. Make sure you do that. Sometimes you, you just invite her to do it. You say, come. Come, come and hug you. Come sit down, sit down. Mm -mm. Yeah, but I have something benefit. Make it burn up. <laughs> I'll turn it off then. All I'm saying here, all I'm saying here is say, invite her into a space where she can feel special. Where she can feel what feels special, okay? She needs honest communication. You know, sometimes um, it is said that we have a challenge in in how we communicate with, um, you know, with how we communicate. Full stop. I am saying here that she needs honest communication. Stop trying to protect her. Stop trying to protect her. Sometimes we we withhold information because we say we're trying to protect. Hey, she needs to know. She needs to know that, 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 that she doesn't put you in a position where you feel, by, um, feel stressed out to, to satisfy a particular need. She needs to know. So when she asks you how you're doing, tell her the truth. Boy, you know, say, um, I am, I am, I'm, I'm here thinking about the bills. I'm here thinking about that. I'm here, I'm, I'm here thinking about this. I'm, I'm here I'm, I'm th thinking about our, our, our children. I'm thinking about the education. I'm thinking about my, all I'm saying here. Say it, man. Say it. You have it battle up inside here. That's why you're stressed out sometimes, you know. Because the female is there for you to release some of this information with her. And, and, and now, you're going to release it to other people who you must release it to. All I'm saying here, right? She needs honest communication. When she asks you how you're doing, tell her how you're doing. Stop fighting to protect her. Tell her how you're doing. She needs to be praised. She needs to be praised. Hey, listen, man. This meal, ah, that outfit, ah, that hairdo, ah. Yeah, even if she bite, it still look good for her. <laughs> I guess I'm saving problem, yes? Right? All I'm saying, but praise her. Praise her. Because, you know, something, other people out there are praise her. And in, and in her mind, she's saying, imagine that. Look how other people is appreciating me, be it physically, be it mentally, um, be it educationally, um, you name it. Look at how I'm being praised and valued. And, and not one time my husband ever compliment me. My husband don't even recognize some of me here. Him don't recognize that, that I did my nails. Okay? Him don't recognize the new hairstyle I have. Him don't recognize the new dress. He doesn't recognize anything. As a matter of fact, when he starts to talk, I appear complaining. So rather than praises, is co complaining. And so what I'm saying here is she needs to be praised. Recognize, identify the, the, the different changes that she, that she has made, even around the house. Wow, you put up on here, that, this is so pretty. That is very nice. Wow, you have new curtains up. Wow, they are very beautiful. And don't just say they are very beautiful, but explain why they're beautiful. Because sometimes we can just use something like one word, you know. But, but, but we we'll only say it because that's something we must say. But, but if they never ask her why, <laughs> if they never ask her why, we we'll get myself in a problem, right? <laughs> I am saying here, she needs to be praised. She needs to help you without fear or anger. 
she feels she must know that she can make certain decisions yes she can make certain decisions you know rather than saying geez and peas and my women do i women do it more cost it more vex or or she, she, she have to come and ask you me i can i um do you think hey this is a partnership it's not a ownership say it again it is a partnership not a ownership and so we say this man she needs to know that she can help without what fear or anger she needs to know that you will defend her and that you will protect her she needs to know her opinions are valuable she needs to share her whole life with you she needs for you to be the kind of man her son can follow and her daughter would be willing to marry will be willing to marry number 3 number 3 to make and keep my marriage mandates that my spouse's bad behavior will not dictate my response my spouse's bad behavior will not dictate my response if you squeeze lime what come out of lime you said it right lime juice if you squeeze orange sweet orange that is what come out of it i was going to say st elizabeth orange but clarend and orange too <laughs> if you squeeze orange what come out of it orange juice see can you imagine you squeeze orange and lime juice come out of it and so that's the question i'm asking myself as i do ask you when you get squeezed what is coming out of you sweetness or sourness i am saying in the relationship guess what happen teeth and tongue get meet teeth and tongue is going to meet guess what happen again said this to you but you can't own it sorry cause it come from me and i put it into, into my book that i'm preparing but teeth and tongue must meet tongue can never bite teeth why is it that whenever tongue gets bitten it continues to function so remember now you know teeth and tongue must meet yes but can tongue bite teeth absolutely not not so why is it that whenever tongue gets bitten it continues to function i want you to answer that question at the end at the end i want you to answer that question that's a riddle for you and please answer it okay now let me move on here i am saying though we say that um bad behavior cannot dictate response we must always be prepared to do the right thing it can't be that um whenever somebody says something to us um we feel as if to say um you know i have to give it back to you in increasing measure well you insult me we have to insult you back when you say this bad to me we have to say something back bad back to you no it's not it's not a matter of fact i'm going to say that i'm i'm going to use that term in in my next slide is is it can't be tit for tat folks it cannot be what tit for tat it cannot be it is that somebody have to be the example of doing the right thing somebody has to be the example about doing the right thing no not every time everybody is going to be on the same plane you know there are times in which you will slip up i agree but please do not set out to um to exact revenge do not set out to do what to exact revenge because then you are allowing a bad behavior to dictate your response by the way if a bad behavior dictates your response it means that the person who did the bad thing is no controlling how you respond they are no controlling how you respond and so now i'm saying here it cannot be we have to recognize that why would i want to treat you in a equally bad manner who are you to me my enemy no i'm a wife the other person is your husband Oh, why would you want to treat them in a bad way? Yes, they said something and you feel hurt. But you don't have to give it back to them in the same way they got it. You can decide that hey, you know something, let me do the right thing in spite of and not because and not just because of. Okay? My next slide number 4 says to make and keep my marriage mandates that I look up to be and not a cross and become. And what what do I mean by that? amazingly in our relationships we consistently 
compete and compare. We are looking at what the other person is doing or not doing in order to release us to do. In order to release us to do. To do. So oftentimes you say, but you not, but you not. <laughs> so we are asking the other person to do in order to release us to do. And I'm saying we must be look, look up to me. Look up to me like, like, like almighty God. What would God want you to do? How would God want you to behave in this relationship? Rather than looking at what the other person is doing or not doing in order to release you to do the right thing. The truth is, we need to own our own reactions. We need to own our own reactions and, and, res and responses and stop shaming, stop, stop blaming, stop criticizing, stop controlling, stop coercing, and stop withdrawing. Ladies and gentlemen, these six things are what we consistently do. We do it over and over and over. We could have married for 98 years. <laughs> we are guilty of doing these uh, one, if not all six of these things. We don't rather than take responsibility for what comes out of us. What do we do? We shame, we blame, we criticize, we control, we coerce, and we withdraw. You see, if we take responsibility for our inner world, it will increase the possibility that others will be, able, will be able to hear us non-defensively if we take responsibility for our inner world. And that statement is your next homework. Homework meaning, at the end, I want us to, 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 to decipher that statement. And what is it? When we take responsibility for our inner world, what does it do? It increases the possibility that others will be able to hear us non-defensively. I want you to, 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 to decipher that at the end, at the end. Okay. Number five, to make and keep my marriage relationship, it mandates that I read my book and stop concentrating on turning your pages. Stop concentrating on turning your pages, which is kind of similar to the one before. Doing the right thing should not be determined by your actions. Watch this though, stay with me now. Doing the right thing should not be determined by your actions. It should not be determined by your inactions, nor it should be determined by your reactions. Say it again, Andre. Doing the right thing should not be determined by, by your what? By your actions, by your inactions, or your reactions. We spend too much time telling our partners, you need to and you're not. You need to, but you're not. You need to, but you know. <laughs> I am saying, folks, stop bellering um, and, and st stop competing with each other. Stop, stop comparing with each other. If there's something ne that needs to be done, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Stop saying, pass up, patakos, kekla, call it black. Hmm? If there's something, if, if, if there's something right for you to do, then go and do the right thing. If there's something right for you to do, then go and do the right thing. Simple as that. Be the example of doing the right thing to and for your partner. Because it is the right thing to do. It sounds like circular reasoning, but that's exactly what I'm inviting. Number six. To make and keep my marriage mandates that my decision will determine my destiny. The three Ds. My decision will determine my destiny. The decisions and the choices we make now, what we make today, um, will determine where my relationship end up and how my relationship end up. I have to be very calculated, ladies and gentlemen, about my choices, about the things that I say, about the things that I do, because some of these things can have an adverse impact upon my life going forward. So I need to take responsibility as to how my life will turn out and not just wait for things to happen in my life. See, am I going to wait for what life gives me? Or am I going to decide what I'm going to take from life? 
I say, let our decision determine our destiny. What kind of goal do we have for our relationship? Where do we want our relationship to end up or to be two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? What kind of plans are we putting in place to ensure that this happens? And, all, and so what I'm saying here, folks, please remember the three Ds. But remember, you cannot, um, my wife would say to me oftentimes, what you put in is what you get out. And so if you don't put in anything, you cannot expect to reap anything. Yes, you can reap something. It's called nothing. <laughs> I am saying to, um, to us that it is very, very important for us to know how to have a goal as to where we want our relationship to be. And, 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 and don't just sit down and just hope. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to say this, and I'm probably going to get myself in, prior, in problem about this. Don't just sit down and pray. You know, I pray God that our relationship will be successful. I pray God that, 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 that all will go well. Huh? So, yeah? You can, it's one thing to pray God for that to happen. It's the next thing to do the opposite things and expect that that prayer is going to be answered. <laughs> you can't pray God for, for, for a successful marriage and, and everything that you're doing um, counters, counters it or is contrary to, to the success of the marriage. No, it doesn't work that way. I'm saying if we're going to pray because we want a successful marriage, then we might need to look at the things that we're saying and look at the things that we're doing so as to ensure the success of the marriage. Okay? All right. Let's move on to number seven. Number seven. We're going fast. We're going fast. We're going far too. Very good. To make and keep my, my marriage mandates that I'm prepared to love you in spite of and not because of. That I'm prepared to love you in spite of and not because of. I like, I like. Okay, we're going to ask that person to mute their mic. I'm trying to find them, but I can't. I don't okay. know who. Okay. Um, so, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from verse 4 to 7 says, love is patient. I must love you in spite of one of the beautiful things about, about there are possibly five, um, four I'm more familiar with, but five Greek words that speaks about love. Um, four I'm more familiar with. Uh, you, have, you have storge, that speaks to love for family. Um, you have philia, um, that speaks to love towards mankind, a love of mankind, a friendly love. Uh, you have Eros, that speaks to the romantic love. And then you have this one here, which is the agape, which speaks to the unconditional love. And what I find unique about 1 Corinthians 13 from, from verse 4, well, all of 1 Corinthians 13, is where Paul is writing to the Christians and he's saying, he's coming out of chapter 12 because they were talking about speaking in tongues. And he says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And so chapter 13 is this more excellent way that he's telling them that they should clamor for. The more, the more excellent way, the more excellent thing to do. And so folks, oftentimes we say that this is the, the divine love. And by no stretch of, the, of, of our imagination, we're not saying it is not so. Yes, it is equally divine. But this divine love is what um, Paul calls upon the church to execute towards one another. We must have that. You know, I used to believe that, that I was, I mean, you know, I could call myself Dr. Love. Yeah. Because I used to be interested in loving my wife the way she wanted to be loved. And I thought I was doing very well until so many years ago, she said to me, um, oh, I want to change the equation. I want you to love me according to 1 Corinthians 13. 
And at St. Andrew, we did an in-depth study on, on, on this First Corinthians chapter 13. And the amount of information that, 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 that came from that study about what love constitutes. Boy, put it this way, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, to love unconditionally, to love in spite of and not because of, is to love, is to have the agape love. Is to have the what? The agape love. The Bible said love is patient, and I'm quoting from the New International Version here. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. I see, love not show up itself, you know. I see. It's, a, it's when the Bible says love is patient, it means that once you are in a place where believe you, me, man, you can't put up, you feel like your cup full, it's that time you must start to love. <laughs> turn up the love flame. It mustn't turn down. It's not time for the flame to go down. It's time for the flame to go up. Love is patient. It's kind. So even when somebody's unkind to you, or you feel that somebody's behavior is an, is an unkind one, you don't have to return the unkind behavior. You don't have to give it back to them in increasing measure. One mango seed equal to a big mango tree. Don't give people mango tree treatment when you get a mango seed. That's all I'm saying here. Love, love is kind. Whatever you're going to give to them, it must be something that is kind. It is not the bad treatment that you have gotten. It does not envy. Okay. It, it is not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. So, you know, so, so love is nothing to the susu susu, you know, and, and, and watchy watchy and I talk about other people, you know, everybody I talk about this person and talk about that person and all those things. Can you imagine? Can you imagine, folks? We claim that we are husband and wife and we are. We are speaking disparagingly about our partner. No, man. Mm -mm. You're speaking disparagingly about your partner. If a one smuddy you're supposed to uh, protect is your partner. But once it reaches a place where you are just a susu but about your partner and everything that the other person is hearing about your partner is something bad. What if you never make up? <laughs> the people must say, no, man, I don't want to make up. <laughs> It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. Ah, but I have some people, you know, in them house, them living like eggshells, you know. Then can't talk, you know. If they never open them out, one bag of barrage are cussing. And all I'm saying, it is not, you can't say, I love you, folks. And the people are not feeling, feeling rather these tenets of love. If you say to somebody, I love you, it means that they must feel 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through to 7. That's what girlfriend, meaning my wife, has asked me to do. She said, I want you to love me according to 1 Corinthians 13. So every time I say, I love you, I, here is my point of reference about what I'm, who I must be to her and how she must feel in the relationship. And how she must feel in the relationship. It's not tit for tat. It's not self-seeking, easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Can you imagine that? It keeps no records of wrong. You remember when you? Remember last week? You remember last year? You remember 10 years ago? You remember 20 years ago? <laughs> and after, and what follows up? What follows that statement? Something negative. You wouldn't even say, remember 10 years ago, when you love me? I hope you still love me the same way, you know. Why did I talk like that? No, but you remember 10 years ago, right? And another 10 times after you say that, is something negative is going to follow. All I'm saying here, folks, love keeps no records of wrong. See, why? Why should I remember all the bad things my wife did to me? Why should my wife remember all the bad things I did to her? Why? Why? Why are we even remembering all the bad things that spouses have done to them one another? And we claim that we love them or love the relationship. Why? You don't love them, man. You don't mean them any good. <laughs> you don't mean them no good, man. You say you love them. I don't know who you love. But love does not keep any records of wrong. What is the objective? 
to remind them of, of how painful the relationship have been? Or do you plan to help them to have a better relationship going better going forward? Is it bitterness or bitterness? Which one? Bitterness or bitterness? Which one? Love does not keep any records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil. A good, I tell people are good. It serves you. It serves you right. I hope you learn a lesson. <laughs> It rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Can you imagine that? You hear the word it used? Always protects. And so when, me, when my wife has my back, so me knows that she loves me. When I have her back, so she knows that I love her. Do you love your one another? How do you show it? Is it according to the tenets here, um, advertised here, uh, or mentioned here rather, as far as 1 Corinthians 13 is concerned from verse 4 to verse 7? It always protects, it always trusts. Always trusts it. It it think it think love, it think love a search phone. <laughs> I want to wait now. Are you text along? <laughs> Who did I talk to? <laughs> it always trusts. Always trusts. Always hope. All being well. I I think I might be speaking tomorrow. Want your folks to to listening up because we're going to talk about hope tomorrow. Always hope. That's the beauty of both love. Love always hopes and love always perseveres. But even sometime, you know, you know what that said to me? Love don't give up. Love don't give up. How you stay with your love? What kind of love do you have? <laughs> Just give me a few more minutes and then I'm going to give you some time, folks, to ask me some questions. That was number seven. Number eight. Number eight. Uh, to make and keep my marriage mandates that I'm prepared to invest more in you. To make and keep my marriage mandates that that I'm that I'm prepared to invest more in you. Stop complaining. Stop complaining about what you don't have or need to get. Start over again. Stop complaining about what you don't have or need to get. Start over again. Stop complaining about what you don't have or need to get. And start concentrating on what you need to give. And start concentrating and on what you need to give. You see, folks, giving, giving ought not to be a compromise. Therefore, we should not give to get. Instead, we give to fulfill a need. We give to do what? To fulfill a need. Getting, by the way, is not a prerequisite for giving. I must be prepared to invest more in you. Can you imagine both persons are investing in each other? And they're not waiting on what they get from each other in order to invest in each other? You see, investment says, I, this is what I'm bringing to the table to make your life, to make this relationship a better one. This is what I'm bringing to the table. But sometimes we might bring the wrong things to the table. So having a conversation with each other to find out what is the best thing I need to bring to the table that everybody can benefit from it, then that's what I'm going to bring. Can you imagine, folks, um, you're drinking soup. You're drinking soup. And somebody says, again, bring a fork. <laughs> you're bringing the wrong thing to the table, man. <laughs> right? Because you like fork. Because fuck is the only thing you know. Because fuck is important to you. No, I am saying is it. Um, we need to be prepared to invest more in the other person. But that investment mandates that we have a conversation with our spouse to find out what can I, what can I say, what can I do that will make your life a whole lot more comfortable in this relationship. It must be that when we're done with you, you must say, no, sir. Me can't lift a man here. <laughs> no, sir. Me can't lift a woman here. 
Mm-mm. You know, because nobody wants it. Me no know if it, I don't know if it, but if, say, if the grass is green on the other side, I don't know. But right now, my, my grass lush. <laughs> no brown spots. <laughs> no need no watering. All I'm saying here, folks, I must be prepared to invest more in you, but in, but in order for us to do so, we need to find out what is the best thing for us to bring to the table so that it can nurture the relationship. Number nine, and we're going to stop at number 10. To make and keep my relationship mandates that I stop competing, comparing, and controlling. And number nine and number 10 is almost one and the same. They complement each other. But let me say it again. We need to stop competing, stop comparing, and stop controlling. The, you need to, but you don't. And look at who is talking. You see those phrases and those statements? They are bombarding our conversations. Somebody says, say it again, I will. The, but you need to, but you don't. But look at who is talking. It's those, those three statements. They are what? They are bombarding our conversations. And when I use the word, I mean, they might bam it up. <laughs> They're not lending to anything positive into the conversation. Oftentimes when we use it and use those terms, it, is, it, it connotates something negative. It speaks to competing, comparing, and controlling. And so what I'm, what I'm inviting us to do as we look at the number 10, since we know what we must not do, then what must we do, Andre? I am saying we should instead be prepared to complement, to complement rather, to complement as against complaining and condemning. What must we do? Complement. So you said, Amon, that's these words we've just introduced here. We say don't compete. We say don't compare. We say don't control. We use the three different terms that speaks volume of competing, comparing, and controlling. But you don't, but look at who's talking, and, um, um, and you need to. Those three terms lends to competing, comparing, and controlling. So what is the antidote? The antidote is to utilize these other three Cs. What must we do instead? We must complement. And the complement there is both with the I and with the E. Complement, P-L-I, and P-L-E. The complement, one of the complements speaks to what we say to each other and how we talk to each other. So we must complement as against complaining and condemning. Why I use the word complaining and condemning? Because that is our go-to conversations with each other. We, we what? We complain and we condemn. I'm going to close with number 10 because I'm going to teach you as, uh, the sandwich. I'm going to teach you the sandwich. I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, that we must cease and desist with complaining and condemning, but instead we must complement. It is the antidote to competing, comparing, and controlling. Complement, both with the I and with the E. We complement each other when we give each other a sandwich a day. So rather than be destructive and critical in our conversation pieces, we learn how to say things nice to each other. So let us go there. School time. So think about the sandwich. This sandwich has three layers. Think about the sandwich. We have, we have compliment at the top, concern in the center, compliment at the bottom. So see the sandwich here, okay? The bread on top is compliment. The, the piece in the center is the meat in the center is concern and the bread at the bottom is another compliment. Now, the bread at the top 
the complement at the top is not the same uh, complement at the bottom. So don't give the complement at the top and feel like you're getting the same complement at the bottom. Market must be a complement, but it must be a different complement. The piece in the center is concern. And I'm saying here, when, once we're having a conversation with each other, what we want to do, we, rather than, rather what than... Concern each other? No, rather than... Okay. You have to have okay. concern. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, compliment, concern, compliment. Um, the compliment is what you say. You say, hey, I noticed that you have... Uh, um, no, rather, you can start this way. You can say, hey, you know, I'm so happy and, and, and excited. I'm so happy and excited about, about what you have done and how you continue to, to, to serve this family and the capacity in which you serve this family. I am concerned about a particular behavior and action um, as I do think because this is the way this action is affecting me. This is how this action is affecting me. Notwithstanding, I am, I, I, am, I am positive with the love that we share for each other. We will find the best way forward um, to, 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 to satisfy each other's <laughs> needs. But no, no, that is, that we might, we might have to, um, so that is the, the, an example of how you give a sandwich. Now, unfortunately, in our way of communicating and talking with each other, we don't do that. We start with the concern. As a matter of fact, we don't even call it concern. We start with the complaint. We start saying, you know what I don't like about you? You know what I keep on doing that and nah, the daylight's out of me. I'm a tired right now. That's how we start. And once we start like that, I can guarantee you the other person who is listening is going to also is going to feel attacked. And once they feel attacked, then they're going to put up their defenses. And once they put up their defenses, then they stop listening to what you have to say. And now they're planning about how to answer you. How to answer you, what to say to you, to make you know, say, you think you alone have a problem? Let me tell you my problem too. <laughs> and so folks, I want to, to, to end this segment um, um, you know, uh, next, 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 uh, on the 19th, I think, we, we, we can continue. But we want to end this segment and hope that you have your comments and your questions. But especially, remember, we gave you two things, two kind of homework like. So we're going to take up the homework at the end um, for you to decipher that statement and also, well, the two statements that were made. Okay. Um, notwithstanding, I'm saying here, folks, that we must look to learn to speak to each other on a different plane. We must look to compliment. It's once we say the right things to each other, then we will compliment each other. Once we say the right things to each other, then we will compliment each other. But if we don't say the right things to each other, then really and truly, we have something that is uncomfortable. We have something that is what? Uncomfortable into our relationship. And so folks, I hope and trust that our presentation today, um, you know, lend us some kind of uh, information as it relates to the making and keeping of our marriages. God bless. All right. So God bless, we're not going anywhere. So, um, so first of all, there's a question. Um, if I'm always doing the right thing in a relationship, won't I eventually become exhausted? Also, won't that build resentment over time? Okay. Um, that's a very good question. Let me, let me start by, let me answer it this way. Did you hear what you said? The person says, if you're doing the right thing. You know, the Bible, and... and and, I, and why it's an important question and a very good question, the Bible does say that we must not become weary in the good that we do. You see, having a perspective of, that says, I am doing the right thing, 
Did you know that no matter how much you mash up uh, an orange, lime juice can come out of it? If you squeeze it and butter, booze can take a hammer and beat it. You know what can never come out of it, no matter how hard you press pan it and mash it up? Lime juice. You see, you see, one of the things, um, maybe a perspective need to, maybe one of the things we need to ask ourselves is, am I created in the image of God? Should a person's bad behavior dictate my response? You know, the Bible says, do good to those who despitefully use you, persecute and say all manner of evil against you. See, we have a responsibility to do the right thing. Just because somebody keep on a thief, a thief, a thief, a thief, a thief from us, does it then put us a place in a place where we say, all right then, the tired of getting thief, me have to start thief back. <laughs> you know? And, and, and so it's it. So I invite us to have a perspective that says, you know what happened? I am not going to become weary in the good that I do. So yes, I, I agree that, that um, it can become tiresome. It, it is quite fatiguing um, and burdensome, right? Because you feel as if somebody is taking advantage of, or as we say it in Jamaica here, disadvantage of way. But while that is true, guess what happened? I still have to prepare, be prepared to do the right thing in spite of and not because of. All right, so we have some compliments we would like to add um, for the presentation. But I'm trying to go back to, all right, here we go. Um, that's the exercise. One of the exercises that we have is to decipher this. When we take responsibility for our inner world, it increases the possibility others will be able to hear us non-defensively. Oh, by the way, um, there was one before that. Um, okay, let me go back. Home. Who was it again? I, I, was it a part of the slide or something I said? Um, okay. said. Uh, I don't remember now. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Um, teeth and tongue. Okay. Teeth and tongue, right. It's something I said. It's not, it's not a part, right. I said, um, teeth and tongue must meet. Tongue can never bite teeth. Let us start with that one. Teeth and tongue must meet. Tongue can never bite teeth. Why is it that whenever teeth, when, why is it that whenever tongue gets bitten, it continues to function? We want somebody to mic up and give us some answers to that. I can say it again. Teeth and tongue must meet. Tongue can never bite teeth. Why is it that whenever tongue gets bitten, tongue continues to function? If I say that tongue don't have no sense, you will. <laughs> <laughs> so that is not the answer. <laughs> Not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> Not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> right. Um, the night call. The night yes, call. Right. yes, please. Um, from Grenada, and uh, I think that the reason why Tom continues to function because Tom wants to, to humble him or herself, and they know that they have a, a, a the function to complete. Okay. Good answer. I must admit. Not the answer I'm looking for, but good answer. <laughs> good answer. And, and as a matter of fact, maybe after I give that answer, maybe you can come back and say, but that's what I said. And I said, I, and then I will agree with you. <laughs> um, yeah. Go ahead. And Casey, is it because Tong knows that he was not intentionally beaten? Excellent. Excellent. Teeth and tongue must meet. Thank you very much. Excellent, Carla um, Anderson. Excellent. So teeth and tongue must, must, must meet. Tongue can never bite teeth, you know. Why is it that whenever tongue gets bitten, it continues to, to function? Because tongue did not believe that, that teeth bite it what? Bite it what? Intentionally. Deliberately. On purpose. Deliberately. On purpose. Excellent. Excellent. Tongue never believed that. As a matter of fact, I agree. I agree that when you bite, when you bite your tongue the first time enough, 
You go, whoa, you ball or whatever, and then you put your tongue on the other side of, the, of your mouth because you don't want to get bite again. But as soon as the pain cool off, you notice you start talk normal. <laughs> I start eat normal too. <laughs> Maybe for the first half an hour, you say, oh, yeah, because you have your tongue on one side of your mouth. But the point I'm making, as soon as you feel better, why? I'm saying tongue recognize that, listen, teeth never set out to bite it intentionally. Well, that is my theory on my teeth and tongue thing. What is my point though? How does this relate to our relationships and our marriages? May I say something? Okay, go ahead. Well, I kind of look at it in a relationship way. I was thinking that because marriage is a partnership, um, it must continue to function. So no matter what happens, whether it be a disagreement or whatever in, in relation to the teeth biting the tongue, it must continue to function. That's how I look at it. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I have created, I'm creating some of these different scenarios that, that I think I've invented, so to speak. I'm not really, really, really invented because there's nothing really under the sun. But I also had my own interpretation of my inve invention. And my interpretation of this invention is this, that if you don't believe, correction, if you do believe that, which, is, which, which, which might be very close to what you just said, I think is Nikisha, I think it was Nikisha. Um, if, you, if you do believe that all, although in the relationship, I am going to be a teat, in the relationship, I am going to be a tongue. What's going to happen in the relationship? We're both going to be teeth and tongue. What am I saying? We're going to bite up our, 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 each other. <laughs> we're going to bite up each other. So here is the point. Since we're going to bite up each other, do we hold it against each other? You know, the person who gets bitten, it's very difficult for you to say to them, don't hold it against the person, especially if they are the ones who keep on getting bitten. That's why I said in my analogy, um, tongue can never bite teeth. So it's not like you say it can return the favor. <laughs> it is always in a vulnerable position. The question is, the question is, do you stay on one side of your mouth even when the pain subsides? One and number two, don't you now make yourself vulnerable to get beaten again? At what stage do you say, listen, enough is enough? Or do you say, you know, something? Or do you then say, you know, I don't believe that my partner set out to bite me. And it is our motives that really, really generates or, or dictates whether or not we stay or we go. Because he who feels it knows it. I know that's supposed to have a whole heap question. <laughs> but that was, the, that was the analogy. Um, if we don't have any qu more questions on that, we can, we can go to the other one about when we take responsibility. But um, in case... Uh, uh, somebody said um, that it's because tongue can't bite back. <laughs> <laughs> tongue cannot bite back. We, we, don't cannot back, back. But, that, but that's not the reason. We are saying motive because the truth is we never bite our tongue deliberately. So since you know that you don't bite your tongue deliberately, which is the hint, then since you know that, then as uh, um, Carla mentioned earlier, um, what do you do? Do I hold it against you? Do I say, listen, no man, we get, you know, we get bite one time too many. And do we now start to violate um, First Corinthians thirteen. I mean, what? You know, we can go and we can go to several different places with this. <laughs> but just saying, somebody can say, "Yeah, but do I stay in an abusive relationship if I am the one that's getting getting beat, bitten over and over and over?" You know, what do we do? Okay, motive though uh, has everything to do with whether we stay or whether we go. Just say. All right, so there's a question. Um, theme says my marriage instead of our marriage. Oh, unlike taking care of my body when I say my marriage, it's implying that one person can make the marriage last. Also, does a lasting marriage imply successful marriage? 
one person can make the relationship last by giving, um, you know, complimenting, etc. But does that guarantee the relationship will be a healthy one? Okay, so that's a question or a comment. Question, I suppose. What you know, as it well, first part seems to be a comment. Well, it's a question, basically, because if let's talk about my marriage, shouldn't it be our marriage? And are we talking about a healthy marriage or just a lasting marriage? So in other words, you can have an unhealthy, unhappy marriage that lasts. Many of those are around. Um, but, I'm, you know, in our context, clearly we're talking about a healthy, a mutually fulfilling yeah. Yeah. relationship. And semantics really as to whether right. I, obviously <laughs> i think one of the things that you were doing is addressing the, the different roles yeah because it takes two persons so we looked at the role of making the wife um happy comfortable um achieving her objectives and we looked at the role of the wife making the husband um achieve his objectives and be comfortable as well so, anybody wants to take on the issue as to what is here? Why we take when we take responsibility for our inner world, it inc increases the possibility others will be able to hear us non-defensively. Anybody want to take that on? We only have a few minutes leave. Yeah. When we take responsibility for our inner world, it increases the possibility others will be able to hear us non-defensively. What does that mean? Okay, good night everyone. So I believe that it's talking about looking in, firstly not looking out. Somebody's speaking, but I'm not hearing them. If you are speaking, can you? I'm not hearing. Come closer now. I'm saying I think that is talking. You can show it short then because I think you're T turn up your mic. I'm just uh, doing that. Oh, okay. I'm oh, sorry. Are you hearing um, me any better? I'll try and um, translate. Go ahead, Karen. Yes, it is. Right. Go so ahead. I'm saying I think it is speaking primarily to looking in and not looking out. So taking responsibility for what you have done, not what your partner has done. So the fact is you cannot control their actions but you certainly can control your reactions right and so you can choose to react rightly and as andre was talking about the orange and the lime juice and so what will happen is when you're doing that then your partner of course will it's, it's not like you're coming across defend um well they will not respond in a defensive manner it will be easier for them to appreciate where you're coming from and respond it will encourage them to respond rightly and their guard will not be up at all because it's not pointing to them, but it is more about you. And I mean, one of the things that, um, that I like to say to is even when you're pointing out what they're doing, it's better to not say you're always this and you're always that, but to say when you do X, it makes me feel Y. So it, it helps to, to break down the defense. And if they care about you, then they'll also care about the way you feel and choose not to make you feel Y anymore or as often as you do. Listen to clapping. Very, very good. Taking responsibility for your inner world. Taking responsibility for your feeling. Taking response. Very, very good. Very, very, very good. Taking responsibility for what you what you heard. Um, and after you hear it, what do you plan to do with that statement or with that feeling? Do you plan to give it back to them and say, "All right, then, watch me, are you?" <laughs> or do you say, "Okay, then." Um, let me not only process this information, but let me also, but let me also find a way to convey to that person how I am feeling without blaming, shaming, coercing, criticizing, controlling. Without my doing these five things, or maybe withdrawing, but more five, without my doing these five things, what kind of conversation I can have with the person where I am taking responsibility where, uh, in relation to my feeling rather than start to blame them or shame them or, or criticize them or tell them, you know, what they must do and what they shouldn't do and say, you can't talk to me, so, <laughs> you know. 
So rather than start off, and that's how we gave you the sandwiches, folks. Rather than start off with, yeah, but you make me feel bad too. Yeah, but you make me do this too. You know, and, and the tit for tat. Rather than going into a tit for tat thing, we just say, hey, you know something? The person said this. This is how it has, has, it has impacted me or made me feel. I'm going to take responsibility for this feeling. I'm going to process this feeling. I'm going to own this feeling. Because maybe it's true, you know. Maybe it's true. But, but maybe it's also a lie. But I am also going to be doing it and find out if the conversation that I just heard, um, is it a fact? If it is a fact, should I do something about it? But oftentimes, we stop. We, we, we're not trying to assess the, the information. We are looking to, to talk about what the person say and how them say it, the manner them say it, the attitude them say it, and all those things. So the truth is we're not taking responsibility for our inner world. We are allowing our inner world to be ruffled by what was said or even who said it to us. And all I'm saying here, it increases the possibility that we will be able to hear non-defensively. Once we're ready now to have a conversation with the person, we're not going to, we're going to use I statements rather than you statements. We're not going to say, you know what, you see, you know what I like about you? And you see, you know, you can't move for them, you know, because what you said to me, no, it is, here is how I felt by the statement. Here's how this statement has impacted me. Okay. The, so is the statement and how it has impacted me. And this is what I'm prepared to do in relation to the, the way this statement has impacted me rather than their coercing or controlling or mandating the other person to make adjustments for us to be better and for us to feel better. Excellent. All right. So thank you very much. We try to uh, stay within certain parameters with respect to time. Um, just want to give you some announcements. One of them is that we will be back for the second part of this on the 19th of December. We'll be using the very same uh, link. So please um, come at 6.30 on the 19th. Okay.